Well, hello, good morning. We're so glad that all of you are here with us, that you're tuning in with us. Listen, today we are ready to give God our worship, to give God our attention. We would love for you to join us as we sing. Come on. Thank you. 
to sing that again. You reign above it all. Give him your highest praise this morning. Give him your worship this morning. He's so delighted when his sons and daughters worship him. So let's sing that together. You reign above it all. Jesus, 
matter where you are right now, if you're in a living room, if you're in a car, you're watching on a phone, a laptop, or you're one of our team members here in the room, man, can we not just agree for a second that our God is so good, He is so sovereign, He is so worthy of all our praise. Come on. He's a faithful God. Come on, let me pray for us. Father, I thank you. God, I thank you for your sovereignty. I thank you for your goodness, your faithfulness, your mercy, your grace. God, I thank you for your love. That even in the middle of a season like this, we can celebrate because we know a savior, a king. The Bible says it this way, that he is the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords. God, be enthroned upon our praise today. Father, I thank you for Jesus. Because of him, we have the hope of eternal life. We have the hope of redemption and salvation. And it's in his great name that I pray all these things. Amen. Hey, welcome Traders Point Online. Thanks for spending part of your weekend here with us. And if you're here with us for the very first time today, welcome. Make yourself known in the chat and then Traders Point, let's celebrate all of our first time guests right now. Just type welcome. And if you're joining us from a platform that has a chat forum, we wanna hear from you during and after the message. Our hosts are looking forward to interacting with you all throughout today's gathering. So welcome each other, encourage each other, and share takeaways that are really speaking to you. You know, thousands of people are joining us online from every state and numerous countries throughout the world. And we've seen people give their lives to Jesus. We've seen people start watch parties and be connected with each other in incredible ways through Traders Point online. And one great way to get connected around here, whether you are in the Indy area or you're hundreds of miles away, is to join a group. Right now, before we continue through the Book of Luke with teaching pastor Ryan Bramlin, we're gonna hear from one of our group leaders, Shaq Thomas, about how being surrounded by community in a group has impacted him. Yeah, so I was 21 when I came to Christ. Um, my life at that point was was pretty hectic. Um, you know, partying a ton, hanging out at bars, but I really didn't have a relationship with those guys. And so I, I interned at a, at a golf course in college and met these three guys that invited me to join a group. And the group was a little different to me because it exposed the relationship that those guys had with Christ on a deeper level. You know, I think there's a quote by Jim Rome that says, you are the average of the five people you hang out with. And, and if those five to eight people are a part of your group and are Christian followers, then it only enhances your life. And I saw that when I joined a group for the first time, and it made me think that I never wanted to, to not be in something like this. I think within my professional sense, it's like, you know, I, I lay out a schedule. I say these are the metrics that I want to reach, but where am I asking God, you know, what do you want me to do? Or how can I do this and, and also be a light to you and your people? So I, I think, I know COVID's been big, but the question I've had to ask for myself after Aaron's message was, where am I waiting? What am I waiting for in my own life? And am I waiting with God or am I just waiting in my own power? Including God in my professional life is a real struggle. Yeah. Like I got up this morning and I was like, here's the list of things that I'm gonna get done today. Here's, here's what I'm gonna do. And never once did I stop, stop and think like, God, please bless me in these efforts. I would say our focus on in the group since the beginning of the year is just to build relationships. And that's how we've grown organically. So if there's anyone in the community that we're building relationships with, we see that they may not have a church family or they may be having issues in their personal life, we invite them to join the group. And that's helped me grow more intentional in my relationship with Christ as well because I know that any given week there's going to be a new person that comes to our group and because of that it's allowed me to to dive deep into scripture and realize that no matter what we talk about no matter if it's, if it's the political climate of the world we need to make sure we're pointing everything back to Jesus. I think the difference between groups and, and going to church on Sunday is just that relationship and those relationships don't only begin or end at church, they, they're outside those church walls as well. And I think a group is just one of those things where you continue to build relationships 
with people who walk and talk like Christ and continue to help you along your journey as well. Because when you think about it, the people that are around you are investing into your life. And if you care about the food you eat, you care about what you drink, you care about how much you work out, I think you should just as much care about who's investing into your life. Come on, can we celebrate Shaq right now and his group? All that they're doing, Shaq, if you're watching right now, incredible. And he's 100% right. Who you surround yourself with, it matters. And if you're watching today and you're thinking, that that's, that's what I want. I don't know if I'm ready for that or is there a spot available for me? There is. You can go to tpcc.org slash groups and someone from our team will follow up with you this week. Don't put it off, all right? So that's a, that's a big one. And then also, before we get rolling with today, we, we have to start by celebrating what God has done this past week, all right? So I want you to lean forward a little bit, wherever you're watching from, and get ready for this, because this is no small thing. This past week, we had 25 people get baptized. 25 people made the decision to give their lives to Jesus and start following him. This is unbelievable. We heard all kinds of crazy stories, too, of like people getting baptized in pools and just doing whatever it took. So if you're on the other side of this and you got baptized this week, just congratulations. It's the biggest decision you'll ever make in your life, and we just want you to know we're here for you. But uh, as far as today goes, Traders Point Online, wherever you're watching from, we even have a few of our team members in the room today. So welcome, everyone. Uh, yeah, we got a few clappers in here. But what we're going to be doing is continuing in our series through the Gospel of Luke that we've kind of titled Settled in Spirit. And uh, a gospel is kind of what you'll see at the beginning of the big section in your Bible that says New Testament. And there's four of these things that kind of kick off what we call the New Testament. Testament, the gospel according to Mark, according to Matthew, according to Luke, according to John. We get four of them. And maybe you've read them and, and maybe you have a hard time kind of figuring them out. Like it seems like one focuses a little bit more on this or this one says this one, but, but this one leaves it out. What, what is that all about? And as I was thinking about this week, I, I think a really good way to, to think about it is to think about the last dance. All right. So the MJ documentary that just came out a little bit ago, if, if you've watched it, It'll kind of put the Gospels into perspective because it could have been titled The Gospel of Michael Jordan, like the good news of MJ. Because what they did was they went back and they interviewed eyewitnesses. They interviewed players that he played against, that he played with. They interviewed coaches and even reporters. And what was fascinating, if you watch the documentary, was everyone described or focused on something different about Jordan. Even if you look to the exact game, the same seconds within that game, each player highlighted a different thing. This is what they remembered, and this is how they told their story through it. It's the same thing with the Gospels. And I love what uh, Aaron's been saying the past few weeks, that, that the Gospel of Luke is really the Gospel for skeptics, for people that are kind of on the outside, because that's who it was written for. Uh, Luke, this physician, takes on this project to write down a detailed account. And what he says at the beginning, he says, I want to give this to you so that you can be certain. I don't know about you, but being certain about something sounds pretty nice. And especially at the time when this was being, being written, Jesus, this message, it was controversial. It was so crazy, it was absurd that most people, they heard it, they believed, they wanted to believe, but in the back of their minds, they were thinking, did this really happen? Is Jesus really who he said he is? Are these stories that I've heard, are they true? And what Luke does is he writes all of this down and he says, yes, it's all true. You can be certain of this, take it to the bank. And the good news is there's even more. It's actually even better than you think it is. And here, take a look at this detailed account. And that's what we're going to be looking at today is Luke. And we're going to pick up in Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 31. And if you have a Bible, you can flip or scroll there. But if not, no worries. Everything will be on the screen next to me. But as you flip or scroll there, I'm going to give you probably 
too much time to get there as I set up the background of what just happened because it'll make what we read today make a lot more sense. But in Luke chapter 4, what's going on is Jesus is beginning his teaching ministry. He's stepping up in these synagogues, in these religious buildings, and he's beginning to preach and teach. And how you start is really important. I know a thing or two about this. Um, I actually used to be a substitute teacher for a little bit. And maybe some of you are like, how many jobs have you had? Every time you get up there, you talk about working somewhere else. And it's true. I've done a lot of things for money, okay? Uh, It is what it is. I said what I said, all right? But I was a substitute teacher. And I can remember how the whole thing kicked off. First day on the job, I show up in the office and they tell me where my assignment is going to be. I go up to the room and I'm sitting there in the chair waiting for the clock to strike, right? Waiting for that bell to ring. And what's the first thing you do as a new teacher, right? The first thing. You write your name on the board, right? Like I can remember all of my teachers, first day, that's what they did. They went to the chalkboard in perfect cursive and wrote their name. That's what I was going to do. So I, I, I map it out perfectly. As the bell is hitting, I'm walking up to the board. But this, this school was advanced. They didn't have chalkboards, all right? They had dry erase boards, all right? But uh, as I'm walking up there, I get there and I go to write my name. Not in perfect cursive, though, because... I'm a millennial and I'm the worst, but in large print, Mr. Bramlett, and I put a line underneath it just to let him know that I mean business. But as I strike the line, the class is losing it behind me. They're laughing. And I turn around and I think of the most teachery thing I can say. And I said, hey, could someone explain to me what's so funny? And this sweet little girl in the front row raised her hand. And I said, speak, child. And she said, that's not a dry erase board. I said, I beg your pardon? She said, I don't know what that means. Um, But that's not a dry erase board. It was a smart board. And just to make it painfully clear for everyone watching and everyone in the room, what I did was just took a marker. It would be like me writing my name on this right now. Everyone in the back of the room would be very upset. It's the worst start that you could possibly have to teaching. But I was so embarrassed that I, the the first thing I said was, it's actually both. (laughs) I said, it's a smart board and it's a dry erase board. Obviously your teacher didn't know that yet. (laughs) And then I took a quick break and told the teacher in the hallway, hey, I just ruined the whole thing. (laughs) That's how I began my teaching career. Jesus, on the other hand, lucky for him, he was teaching before smart board, so he doesn't run into that problem. But at the same time, Jesus is doing something different. Just like me writing on computers with markers, he was doing something different, something that no one had ever seen before. And that's what we're going to see as we pick up in verse 31. Take a look at this. It says, then Jesus went to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and taught there in the synagogue every Sabbath day. And there too, the people were amazed at his teaching, for he spoke with authority. Now, just to to set this up, this, and it's really that last word there that kind of differentiates Jesus from everything else that was going on. And it's that last word there, authority. Authority. It says that Jesus was teaching with authority. He was was teaching with power. He was introducing something new. That was the big thing. Like they had teachers, they had rabbis, but everyone was just explaining what had always been explained. But when Jesus steps up, he says, I actually have something new to say, which was very different. Because if you can even think back to your teachers, like when I was a teacher (laughs) for that year, um, I was not there to present any new information. I wasn't like, hey, kids, I've been working on this new math theory. Let's try it out today. No, it was please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. That's what we were working on. That's what I was going off of, the classics. But Jesus, he actually steps up with authority, with power, and he teaches from these scriptures. And he says, hey, you kind of got it a little bit off, and or you just don't have enough of the information, but I'm here and I'm going to give you all of it. 
and he, he began to teach, and if you were here a few weeks ago, Aaron was talking about this, that, that as he taught, he not only taught something new, he actually said that he himself was the fulfillment of all Scripture, that he was the one that was going to come in and usher in this new kingdom of God. Pretty new, pretty powerful. You need a lot of authority to say that. Some people loved him. Some th people thought this was the best news they had ever heard. Some people a little bit more slow to change. They did not appreciate this message from Jesus. And by not appreciate it, I mean they tried to kill my man, all right? So they tried to, they tried to assassinate Jesus for the way he's teaching. They try to throw him off a cliff, but, but he, he steps aside, he gets away, but that doesn't stop him. Because as we're going to see in the, script, the scriptures today, this is what he came to do, to preach, to tell them and to tell us what God is really like and what he's about and that's what we're going to pick up today um, in chapter 4. Look at, look at what happens next. A after he avoids getting thrown off the cliff, it says, Once, when he was in the synagogue, a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit, cried out, shouting, Go away. Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus, he reprimanded him. Be quiet. Come out of the man, he ordered. At that, the demon threw the man to the floor as the crowd watched. Then it came out of him without hurting him any further. Amazed, the people exclaimed, what authority and power this man's words possess. Even evil spirits obey him, and they flee at his command. And the news about Jesus spread through every village in the entire region. So here's the scene. Jesus is teaching. He's in the middle of his sermon. And a demon-possessed man starts shouting in the front row, shouting, Go away. Why are you interfering with us? Leave us alone. Now, I don't want to make today about demons and evil spirits, but Jesus does. And, and maybe that, that kind of throws you off as we started talking about demons and evil spirits. Like, I don't know if I can go with you there. And I think the word itself might throw you, but I don't think the concept of it really does. Because whether you use demon or evil spirit or bad energy... There's something that I think a lot of us could rally around and say, yeah, there's something there. That maybe you've, you've worked through something really hard with someone. Someone was going through and you could just feel it felt like something was opposing them. It felt like they weren't themselves. And it's just like yeah, you couldn't shake it. Or maybe you're coming out of the other side of it and you were healed of something. And you can look back and you say, yeah, there was something there that was against me. And for us to, to really understand why Jesus came and all that he did, we have to get to this. As, as hard as it may be to hear or to understand that, that there is not only physical things that we face, physical battles. There is also a spiritual war that is going on. And you'll see throughout scripture that Jesus both healed people of physical problems, but he also healed people from spiritual problems. And the good news is that he is still healing people uh, from both today. But what I want us to see in this, because it, it, it about destroyed me. I believe God gave me this. I can tell you where I was. 6.52 Wednesday morning as I was meditating on these verses. This is what stuck out to me. The man didn't ask for the demon to be removed. The man didn't ask for the demon to be removed. And just stick with me for a second as I kind of tell you what I mean by this. And what would have happened in our context would be like we're in church, a sermon's being preached, and a man just began screaming and shouting and saying, leave me alone. What really just kind of wrecked me was that the man wasn't there for healing. 
The, he didn't show up because Jesus was there and he thought that he could get this from Jesus. It doesn't even say he knew about this demon. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he had lived with it for so long that he couldn't tell a difference between where he ended and where this demon picked up. He just thought, this is who I'll always be. But by just being there, by just being in the presence of Jesus, this demon couldn't stand it. The man didn't ask for it, but the demon couldn't stand it. And the closer he got to Jesus, he had to speak out with leave me alone. And Jesus, how powerful he is, how powerful God is that by just being in his presence, healing comes. Because here's the truth, that demons tremble with terror in the presence of Jesus. Demons tremble with terror in the presence of Jesus. We see this throughout Scripture, that whenever Jesus shows up and whatever comes into the presence of God, if it's not of God, it can't stand against it. It begins to speak out. It begins to fall over. There begins to be this controversy of stop messing with me. Leave us alone. What part do you have to do with me? Because they are terrified of what Jesus came to bring. And we see that as he steps onto the scene, everywhere he goes, that they tremble at his presence. They can't live there. And this is why it's so important to be encouraged in this season, but in every season of how big of a deal it is to not stop connecting with God, but to remain in his presence. Because we need to be engaged now more than ever. Because as old habits try to come back, or new addictions start to come up, the only shot we have of defeating them is to bring them into the presence of Jesus. And the Bible has all kinds of stories like this. That if you just look at anyone that came into contact really with Jesus, most of them didn't ask for it. Most of them weren't looking for it. But when they came in the presence of God, their lives changed. They were willing to give up everything for it. The disciples, followers of Jesus, they weren't looking for Jesus. They weren't looking for a new life. They were trying to catch some fish. And Jesus showed up and he changed everything. And they sacrificed it all and said, there's nothing like being in the presence of Jesus. He's given me what nothing else can give. There's another story of a, a woman at a well who goes and she's just in a horrible spot. So much baggage. She's taken on this identity that's not who she is. She wasn't looking for Jesus. She was looking for water. But she comes face to face in the presence of Jesus and he restores her. He lets her know what her identity really is. It changes her life. Everything changes for her. And she goes and tells everyone everywhere about who Jesus is and all that he's done. I mean, anyone here, anyone here get met by Jesus and you're like, I wasn't even looking for God. I was just trying to live my life. I was just going through. And then out of nowhere, I came into the presence of Jesus and I never wanted to leave. This is my story. I wasn't looking for Jesus. I didn't even have demons that I was trying to fight. I didn't have a void I knew about. I was trying to go on a second date with a beautiful young lady. And she told me, do you know about Jesus? Jesus, the one who loves us. Jesus, the one who came here and died for us. Told me this whole thing and just being there under the name of Jesus, my whole life changed. And it just brought me to this space of how important it is to stay close to God. Because what we're going to see is this, this demon that he, that he heals, or this demon that he removes, he heals this man. It's just the beginning. And what we're going to see in these next few verses that I want us to hold on to is that there is nothing God can't cast out. There is nothing that God can't cast out. If you bring it into the presence of Jesus... There is nothing that can stand against it. Perfect love will cast out everything. Even, even the tricks of the devil can't stand against it. Shame, guilt, fear, none of that can live in the presence of Jesus. Because what Jesus does here, he heals this man in the synagogue. And as you can imagine, it gets people talking. No one just leaves that day quietly like, ah, what do you want to do for lunch? You thinking Panera? Great pick two options they have over there. No, everyone runs out like, you won't believe it. The guy, Jesus, the one that was teaching, that new teaching, 
He healed a man. I saw him speak. I saw a man fall. And I saw him healed in a moment. And they begin to tell everyone. They go from village to village telling everyone about what Jesus did. And Jesus, in the meantime, he goes back to this guy Simon's house. And Simon's mother-in-law is pretty much, it looks like she's on her deathbed. She has this high fever. And Jesus walks into the room and he touches her by the hand. She's in his presence. She's immediately healed. Not like, oh, starting to get better. No, in in an instant, she is healed. And she pops up and she goes from on her deathbed to go making appetizers for everyone at this party. Just like pizza bites, pizza bagels for everyone is there. It's, It's all happening in a moment. And then as they're sitting there, it's gone viral. Everyone begins to swarm. Everyone comes into the village looking for Jesus because they've heard. This is the Jesus. This is the Son of God. This is the Messiah. And look at, what, look at what happens next. It says, as the sun went down that evening, people throughout the village brought sick family members to Jesus. No matter what their diseases were, the touch of his hand healed everyone. Many were possessed by demons. And the demons came out at his command shouting, you are the son of God. But because they knew he was the Messiah, the Son of God, he rebuked them and refused to let them speak. This is incredible. And what I want us to focus on first, there's so much here, but what I want us to see is that line, no matter what. No matter what. Everyone in the room right now, can we say no matter what? Everyone watching online, you got to chat right now, type it in there, no matter what. What, no matter what their diseases were, the touch of his hand healed every one, no matter what. And because the reason I say this, the reason I want to say it out loud, the reason I want to type it in the chat so that you can stare at it, is because it becomes so quick to forget. That we begin to buy into this lie that creeps in and whispers to us, not for you, not for you. Your problems are worse. You, you, you are a little bit too far gone. You're not like everyone else. Your problems are not their problems. They might be accepted, but if for you, are you crazy? If they knew who you really were, if they knew what you had really done, if God is really God, then you will never be accepted. And I know that this is a thought because I talk to people. And I hear it come out when I'm talking to people and we get to that point in the conversation of like, hey, what do you do? Oh, me? I'm a, I'm a pastor and I preach, which always goes over great. Usually people have zero hesitations, no questions, and just love me right where I am. No, kidding. Uh, but usually what follows is, oh, man, church, I could never go. I'm telling you, if I went to your church, the whole place would cave in. If I went to your church, that place would catch fire. I mean, if I went lightning, I'm like, all right, I get it. Uh, The church would. But I think we're off. That's what I always say. I think we have a different idea of who Jesus is and what the church is all about. Because that's not the God that I know. That's not the God that I've come to love. And that's what I want us to do right now. Instead of just listening to the narrative of your head, in your head, the the whispers that keep coming in, of saying who you're not and what God will or won't do or how you'll be accepted or rejected, I just want us to go to the source. That's what Luke's doing. That's what we do every single Sunday. What did Jesus say? Does Jesus say that there's some kind of limit? Does Jesus say that there's a test? Does Jesus say there's this, you got to do these things, then maybe? No. He makes it very clear. He said, no. No matter what, no matter what their diseases were, no matter what their past was, they were getting healed. And today God is still doing the same thing that he's always been doing. And can we celebrate that? No matter what, can we celebrate a God who heals? A God who knows no bounds. A God whose grace extends to all of us, even when we're not asking for it. Even when we just find ourselves next to him, he provides healing. 
This is what Jesus does. He does all of that. He provides the healing. He provides the forgiveness. He provides the salvation. But even us, and I'm talking right now to people that would call themselves followers of Jesus. What about us? What do we do? And I love in this scripture that it's even foreshadowed of what the church will do as a result of what Jesus has done. Take a look at this. People throughout the village brought sick family members to Jesus, no matter what their diseases were. If you're wondering what it is that we do as followers of Jesus, it's that. We go to our village. We go to our city. Wherever you're watching from, you start there, and you go and you find people, and you say, you got to meet Jesus. I got to get you close to Jesus. You got to come to know about the love of Jesus. You got to know how Jesus heals everyone. Just being in his presence will change everything. You need to know about him. And we remove any unnecessary barriers so that we can get him or her to a front row seat so that they can see Jesus and meet him and be changed by him. I've given my life to this mission. And I can promise you, there is nothing special about me. The only thing that I got going for me is this. I've seen too much. I've seen too much. That's what gives me the courage to stand on a stage. That's what gives me the courage to go out and to have conversations. That's what allows me to continue to point to Jesus because I've seen too much. I've seen God work. I've seen God restore marriages. I've seen God take away addictions. I've seen God cure people of depression. I've seen God do just things that only he could do. And I've been brought to this place of I've seen too much. You can't tell me otherwise. So for the rest of my life, I'm going to spend it taking people by the hand and saying, you got to come and know Jesus. You got to just be in his presence because I'm telling you, there is nothing like it. Is there anyone here today that would say, I've seen too much. You can't tell me otherwise. That God is at work. That's what we do. That our opening line is not, look at us, look at me. Our opening line is always and only Jesus. Here it is. The best thing, the best thing we can do as followers of Jesus is show someone the scars our Savior healed. Somewhere along the way, we lost this. And we exchanged this for Christian makeup. And this idea that I just have to pretend. And I got to put some polish on that I can go out with this weird, creepy smile and fake it. And that people will want to be a part of that. No one wants to be a part of that. No one needs something else to be fake. Especially when we don't have to fake it. When we seriously have something that is that good. Instead of the makeup, take it off. Show people your scars so you won't believe it. You, don't, well, you won't believe where I once was, but let me tell you. I was blind, but now I can see. I was hurting, but then God saved me. My divorce was going down. I mean, my marriage was going down to divorce, but then he came in and restored it all. I had this addiction that I couldn't get past, and then Jesus came and healed everything. Show people where you've been and to show people how far God has brought you. I'm telling you, these verses, when I first read it uh, at the beginning of the week, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to have enough to say uh, with these first few verses. But can I just say, I think God laughed in my face um, that there's a, so much here in every part of Scripture. But we got two more verses for today. You guys good with two more verses? Two more verses to work through. And what's going to happen here? is we're going to see the how. Because what we've been reading is just Jesus healing, Jesus doing these incredible things. But Jesus gives us this, this, this unbelievable insight as to how and why he's able to do what he does. And it's an encouragement for all of us. Look at this. Early the next morning, Jesus went out to an isolated place. And the crowd searched everywhere for him. And when they finally found him, they begged him not to leave them. But he replied, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns too. Because that is why I was sent. So he continued to travel around preaching in synagogues throughout 
Judea. This is fascinating. I mean, it was just the most incredible day that the earth has ever seen. Jesus is healing person after person after person. He's so connected to God. But yet the next morning, the first thing that he does after that healing rampage is that it says that he goes out to this isolated place. He goes out to be alone. And maybe when you read that, you're thinking, what was he, what was he doing out there? He was going to pray. But what is prayer? He was going to be in the presence of God. Because even Jesus knew how important that was. That that's where the power comes from. That the life that we want, that it cannot come without it. It is not sold separately. That as we follow God, that we are going to have to remain in this space connected to him. And you see this throughout scripture. You'll, you'll find Jesus in a lonely place, in a desolate place, in an isolated place, all doing the same thing. Shutting everything else down so that he can connect with God and be in the presence of God. And what I want to ask you today is, do you have that? Do you have an, an isolated place that you can go to? As you know, I spent the first part of the, the year reading through the Gospels, those first four books of the New Testament that we were talking about. And I just read them over and over again, looking for something different. Because usually I read them and I look for what Jesus says. Call me crazy, it's a book, but that's usually the way I take these things. What are they saying? What's going on? But this year I started reading, looking behind it, saying not just what did he say, but what did he do? What was the life that he lived? What were some of his habits? What were some of his rhythms day in and day out? And this one stood out like crazy. That he's always just getting away with God. He's always carving out time. Even when the life around him is going crazy, he, he makes time for God. And I, it brings us to a really good point that we aren't just called to believe like Jesus believed. It's something much bigger than that. We're actually called to live like Jesus lived. So as we go through this, I mean, there's a lot here that we can take in to say, how can I be in the presence of God always? Not just in crisis, not just when I hit rock bottom. What would it look like me to seek the presence of God? Not to just stumble upon it. That it's amazing that God's grace meets me when I'm not even looking for it. But what if I went looking for it? What if I situated myself there? How much more then would God do? And I'm telling you, one of the, the biggest gifts of COVID, and I know that's a loaded statement, like, what are you talking about, man? <laughs> Have you been outside? But one of the gifts of COVID was this, that I was able to find an isolated place. And it was every morning in my house, well, in my old house. Um, we sold our house this week and we moved in with my old roommates. And by old roommates, I mean my parents. <laughs> Love you guys. So thankful for you. Um, but whenever I was going through this, especially when it first started, I would get up really early in the morning. And I would go up to the attic and I had this window there and I would just look out and I would talk to God. And it would be silent. There was nothing to go along with it. I would just sit there. And some days he would speak. And some days I would be frustrated. And I'm telling you, they were some of the best, most worst times of my life. Painful, some joyful. But I was connecting with God on a, in a level that I had never connected before. And it happened through this, through this isolated place. And I know that's hard. I know as I'm going through it, you're like, must be nice, preacher man. You have an isolated place. Well, I have a life, okay, so I don't have isolated places. And I get it. I have three very small humans in my, in my house as well. And whether you have kids or not, you're not just going to slip and fall into an isolated place. It's something that you have to carve out. It's something that you have to be intentional about. But I'm telling you, if we know this, if we know this for a fact, that demons shudder in terror in the presence of Jesus, 
if we know that his love casts out our all fear, where else would we want to be? But if we could get into this spot and start our mornings from there, nothing can stop us. Because if the one that is in me is greater than anything in the world, then I'm starting off in a place that I can't lose. But I do want to put some disclaimers out there. An isolated place. First, and this one's pretty much for the fellas. The bathroom is not your isolated place. Like, you cannot start this week like, yeah, I know, I was in there a while, but that's my isolated place. I was just in there talking to God. No, you weren't, okay? <laughs> Scratch that. The second thing, we're not thinking about this as an escape. This isn't something that you're running from. This is something you're running towards. You are going to be with God to connect with God. And the, the amazing thing is you're not alone because I promise you every time you carve out the time, God's spirit carves out the time. He will be there with you over and over and over again. That this isn't something that we escape from. And this isn't a call to live isolated because maybe that's the other message that's going in your mind right now of like, Everyone's telling me not to be isolated, and now you're telling me to be isolated. No, this is about going to an isolated place for a very specific time so that we can be in the presence of God and so that we can hear from his spirit so that we can be sent out. That's exactly what we see here with Jesus. That Jesus went into this space, this isolated space, talked to God, connected with God, was in the presence of God, and his first response as he came out was what? I can't stay. God is sending me that I got my marching orders. I came here to do one thing and one thing only, to preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus. So thankful for your hospitality, but I have to go. That's the same thing for us, that we are going to be with God so that we can go out and to live for God. And what we want to do this week is just to challenge you. Challenge you to be in the presence of God every day. And we want to give you two ways to do that. Two ways to do that. The first one's this. Identify an isolated place and carve out 10 minutes every day this week to be alone with God. Identify an isolated place. And I'm going to put a few more action steps on this. So identify it. Like I said, you're not just going to wake up tomorrow and it's going to be noon and you're just like, oh, this is, this is a great isolated place. Wow, I didn't, know I, I didn't know about this. No. So before you go to bed tonight, think about tomorrow. Think about where you'll be and when you have to be there and you're going to have to carve it out. We don't have extra time. It's about using the time that we have. So carve it out and say, I'm going to give 10 minutes of my day to sit in the presence of God, to talk to him, to hear from him, and just watch how everything begins to well up, how demons, how evil spirits, how things that we're struggling with, things that we're afraid of, get uncomfortable in the presence of Jesus. And then don't just keep it on you. Tonight, before you go to bed, send a message to someone and say, hey, this week, every day, I'm given 10 minutes, I'm gonna find an isolated place and I'm gonna be with God. And maybe you're thinking right now, I don't have that person. I don't have somebody I can send and say that to. Well, great. That leads me to the second point. Join a group. tpcc.org slash groups. This is what a group does, what Shaq was talking about. Constantly encouraging you to be in the presence of Jesus. That as you're going through life, you need people. I need people that are going to push me along and say, no, 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 you're too far over here. No, no, you need to get back over here. You need people that are going to ask you, when was the last time you've been with Jesus? No, yeah, yeah, I know you serve. I, I know you do all those things. When was the last time you were with Jesus? Because that's the most important thing that we can do. And that is what we do every single week. It's at the core of it all why we meet on Sundays, why we do watch parties, why we do groups, why we talk about prayer, why we have DBR, daily Bible reading. It's all so that we can get in the presence of God. 
because it's the only thing we've found strong enough to deal with everything that's out there. And what I want us to do right now is just to end today the same way we want to begin this week, and it's just to be in the presence of God. So if you could, everyone in the room, would you, would you stand with me? Everyone online, would you stand? And what we're going to do right now is just connect. This is what worship is all about. This is what church is all about. This is what community is all about. Getting to this spot in the presence of God. Because we serve a God who is unbelievable. We serve a God who heals even when we're not looking for it. We serve a God who extends grace even when we don't deserve it. We serve a God who came here, left heaven, lived a perfect life for me and you, and then went to a cross while we were still his enemies and said, I'm gonna die for them. I'm gonna give my life for theirs. And that if we would believe in that, in that gospel, the gospel Luke's talking about, then Jesus said, I'm gonna go even further and I'm gonna give you the power of my spirit. That everywhere you go, I'm gonna go. That nothing will be able to stop you. That I will be with you and you can bet on that so that, not so that we can just know more about God, not so that we can just put on makeup and pretend, but so that we can go out so that we can be sent, so that we can take people by the hand and say, you gotta know this Jesus. Let me tell you about all that he's done. Let me tell you about where I was and where he brought me. Let me tell you that he's right there for you too. And there's nothing that is gonna stop him. And what we're gonna do right now in the presence of God is watch everything else fade away. We're gonna come to this spot with Jesus in his spirit because we know that he makes the darkness run. We know that he stands in an empty grave. And what I wanna say right now is no matter where you are, if you're on the outside, if you're a skeptic, Jesus is for you. Jesus is for the thief, for the criminal. Jesus is for the addict, for the one that's trying to find that fulfillment, for the promiscuous, for the one searching for love. God is for you. God is for you, the one that is hung over right now, watching through one eye, wishing I wouldn't be so loud. God is for you. God is ready to extend his grace to you. What we have to do is just say yes, to get into his presence and watch him do what only he can do. And I'm gonna pray right now, and that's my prayer. I'm gonna pray that God would show up, that we would turn that we would respond. If that's you, respond for the first time. We got a spot for you. Go to tpcc.org slash Jesus. Someone from our team will follow up with you and talk about what it looks like to follow Jesus. For all of us though, we need this going into this week. We need the presence of God. We need demons to know. We need the evil spirits to know that our Jesus went to war with the devil and smashed him under his foot. That it's not a contest. That that's what we're standing in this week. So if you would, would you pray with me? God, we pray to you. We pray to you that under that name, the name of Jesus, that demons tremble in fear. In the name of Jesus, that God perfect love would cast out all fear. In the name of Jesus, you would bring healing. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, that you would lead us through this. God, in your name this week, we're gonna carve out time to be with you, not to do anything, just to be with you, to hear from you, to experience your love so that we can go out, so that we can be sent, so we can tell everyone about this kingdom of a God who would leave heaven, who would die for humanity, who sinned in his spirit, who's done everything that we needed. God, we point to you, and it is in your name, Jesus, that we pray.
living out that truth, you can go to tpcc.org slash Jesus, and someone from our team will follow up with you this week to help you take your next steps. If you're ready to get connected in a community and to start growing in your faith, head to tpcc.org slash groups. Our team is ready to get you plugged in into a group. Thanks again for being with us today. We'll see you back here next week as we continue our series. Amen.